Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another episode of the Ahmed Khan podcast. Today we are here joined by Sheikh Dawood Walid. Uh, a brief biography about Sheikh Dawood is he is currently the executive director of the Michigan chapter of the Council of American Islamic Relations, also known as CARE. And he is a member of the Michigan Muslim Community Council for Imams. Um, in terms of publications, Sheikh Dawood Walid has published a number of books, including Blackness and Islam. And the book that we will be discussing today for today's podcast, inshallah, Towards Sacred Activism, a book explaining um, almost an instruction manual on how to engage activism in today's discourse. So thank you for joining us, Sheikh Dawood. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. So Sheikh Dawood, in, in today's discourse, there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion around activism. And activism is sometimes uh, analyzed through a secular perspective. And but but for Muslims, we have a different paradigm in which we are operating in. And so when it comes to um, figuring out what social justice is in Islam, first I think it's important we define what social justice is. So that's the first question I have for you. What exactly is social justice according to Islam? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Um, first of all, let me say, Brother Ahmed, it's good seeing you and a pleasure being on your podcast. And I hope uh, in 2022, I'm able to make it out to, uh, to British Columbia and to Vancouver and to meet up with the, the brothers and sisters, inshallah. Um, when you talk about the term social justice um, from an Islamic perspective, when we look at old Islamic texts, this term is not used. Actually, the coinage of the term social justice is really a type of nomenclature that came about in the, in the 18th century um, from, from my, my research. Um, but we do have the concept, or not the concept, the, the divine uh, mandate and construct of instituting justice and justice itself. And from that, uh, there is various aspects of how we would look at justice as far as not only dealing with human beings as us being Muslims, but how we deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation and with other created beings that aren't human beings, uh, animals, and even uh, the environment, which is also uh, a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But just very simply put, that uh, the term justice that we do have in our old Islamic books is adala or adal. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us uh, using the same word, i'dilu huwa akrabul taqwa, be just, and this is what is most close to God consciousness or piety. Uh, adala in the very rudimentary sense of the term, the very basic understanding is that when things are operating in their right places, or things or people are given their just due, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them their rights, then this would be justice, right? And so Al Adil is one of the beautiful names of God. Uh, he is the just, meaning He is the one that set the balance of all things. He put everything in their proper places that He intended them to function in. When people take things outside of their proper places, then this is the opposite of justice. This is zulm, or this is wrongdoing, or injustice, or oppression. So <clears throat> when we're talking about this issue of justice and things operating in their proper places, then our epistemology or our, our way of understanding the truth, if we are trying to seek true justice, since God, Allah, is the source of justice, we firstly go to Allah's book, the Quran. And then we go to the statements of our beloved Al-Habib Al-Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who spoke the truth and did not speak from his own desires, as the Quran says about him, right? So we believe that the Quran is our objective truth and is the first criterion in which we see about whether things are in their right places or not, right? So this is an Islamic paradigm that's different from 
a secular paradigm where the issue of justice can be based in secular sensitivities and maybe wherever the winds blow, perhaps something that was fundamentally seen as wrong for the history of humankind ends up becoming a justice issue. And people say, if you don't do this, if you can't do it, then it's injustice, right? So our understanding of justice is not just, is not based upon al hawa or vain desires or our feelings, right? So feelings are important, but feelings are subjective. They're not objective. And our ultimate way of how we understand a justice issue just isn't based upon feelings or the winds of emotions or the polling of public sentiment. That's not our primary focus of how we should approach the issue of justice, which would then uh, extend to social justice issues as this term is used in the 21st century in, in, in Western societies such as in Canada or in the United States of America. Exactly, Sheikh Dawood. And there was, there was a French philosopher named uh, René Gounan who in the 20th century, who took his shahada and became Muslim. And he said the fundamental problem with the world today is that everybody values action over knowledge. And he said that in today's age, because we don't have an understanding of knowledge, we are simply going out and doing whatever our desires thinks are, ple uh, are pleasurable. And we don't really have an accurate idea of what justice is. And in your book, you've said that justice is putting places within their proper places, giving everybody their equal dignity, their humanity. And when those rights are stripped away from them, that's when we have wulm. That's when we have oppression. But if we don't have something like a scripture, like a Quran, which can, which can inform us of things that are truth and things which are batil, which are false, then we end up chasing things that we don't know whether or not uh, one day they're morally right and the next day they're morally wrong and the next day they're morally right again. And so that was one of, uh, one of the important concepts I took from your book is that justice is putting things in their proper places. And I don't know if you remember, but when uh, last time you were here in Vancouver, I told you I was, uh, uh, I was invited to deliver uh, a lecture on social justice in Islam. And when I, when I delivered that lecture in the beginning, um, I asked the students, um, and these were students around the ages of 25 to 30. So they were adults. And I asked them to define justice. And for a while, nobody had an answer because they just felt that justice is justice. Like, like, like we can see if it's justice or it's oppression. And I said, that's not valid because what if your understanding of justice is a genocide? And so they were very confused. And when I explained to them this definition of justice, immediately it clicked in their mind and they said, that's what justice is. And so that um, experiment is, I think, a good example of people not knowing what exactly justice is before going out and becoming activists and trying to acquire social justice. Yes, and this is why many of our scholars uh, of usul and, and, and fiqh um, of, the, of the, the foundations of our deen and those who gave the rulings uh, on enjoying the good and forbidding the evil, that a number of the scholars, they mentioned as a prerequisite of enjoying good and forbidding evil is actually having knowledge mm -hmm. of what is justice and what is injustice. Because without knowledge, firstly, the broad parameters, but then understanding or having some rudimentary knowledge of the specifics, then how can one actually enjoy good and forbid evil if they don't know the difference, right? So this requires a level of study and a level of mentorship. And this is what, I mean, this is what the scholars have said for Ibn Qudama al-Maqdasi, one of the great Hanbali scholars. He's a hujja in the traditional Hanbali school of thought. He was a student of, of Abdul Qadir Jilani. Uh, so many of the scholars, as Ibn Taymiyyah, so many of the scholars who talked about this issue of enjoining the good and what is justice and forbidding the evil and the, and the injustice said you have to have knowledge. So otherwise, if we don't have knowledge, um, our de facto position should be to stay silent, say, to stay silent and stay still instead of acting. And also one of the uh, the great scholars who's Moroccan, 
of the Maliki school, uh, Ahmed Zuruk, he said, it is impermissible for anyone to proceed in an endeavor until they know the ruling of Allah pertaining to it. So this is very important for people who talk about they want to be in activism or they want to do something. You have to take time to first learn your deen and then to sit under some teachers and actually learn and take mashura, take consultation, right? This is very important. Um, in this day and time, people want to jump on the bandwagon to every cause. They even want to be quick to click and like something on social media or share a post. And I would say even before you share something on social media or like it, if you have any doubt, stay away from it. If you haven't learned the ruling of Allah pertaining to it, don't share it just because it's popular. Don't even sign on to a petition, right? Until you are able, and certain things are clear cut and there are certain things that may be more ambiguous. And those people who take mashura, consultation on the ambiguous things and stay still until they get clarity. These are people of wisdom and people who will get the fuddle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get his grace. Those people who rush into things, rush into the arms of shaitan. They rush into the arms of the devil. And, and so it's not just based upon feelings. Hmm. And I think, you know, subhanAllah, um, when we look at the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu in jaakum fasiqum binaba'in fatabayyanu that all oh, you who believe if you know a troublemaker if somebody comes to deliver news to you confirm it before you pass it on because it might harm people and we live in, in, in an age today of fake news <laughs> where we have these major broadcasts like CNN, Fox News who have their own political agendas and are distorting information to fit into their own narrative and everybody including our scholars are falling susceptible to certain clickbait articles and such and such. So um, the importance of confirming news in today's age is more difficult than ever. But Sheikh Dawood, uh, I want to transition just to, uh, you know, in your book, you talk about setting parameters when engaging in social justice, um, particularly with other groups, which are not Muslims or have a different background than us. What are some of the parameters that you think we need to establish with other organizations. For example, the Palestine cause is very big right now. And everybody <clears throat> is trying to get to get together to work on it. People with completely different agendas coming from completely different paradigms are wanting to come together and work. Um, but in some cases, organizations are thinking that this is a, if I scratch your back, you scratch our back situation. And I know some of our MSAs are currently dealing with this. So what guidance can you give to us in terms of what parameters we should recognize and establish before establishing any of these relationships? Okay, so number one, we must be clear on our objectives. And our ultimate objective should be the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the actual uh, endeavor that we are seeking. That is something that is secondary. Allah is the ultimate goal, right? And that is his felicity his, his ridha, his pleasure, right? If, in fact, that is clear in our hearts and in our minds, then we seek to do what we're doing in our objectives according to not only the final objective we're looking for, the outcome, but also the means that we are using should be those means that conform with the Quran, the Sunnah, and the consensus of the righteous of our of, of our community going back since the the early three pious generations right so we have a criterion now is it okay for us to work with people who aren't muslims of course right for that matter there are muslims who don't even uh, uh operate based upon the quran and sunnah so right so we look at the objective is the objective righteous if it conforms with the quran and sunnah right? If other people are trying to get to the same place, even if they're starting from a different uh, uh, place, that's no problem, right? Uh, but there's two things that we have to be careful of. Number one, are we coming underneath someone else's umbrella and joining their platform in which they are promoting that which is forbidden in regards to advancing the cause that we both at least explicitly say we agree upon. 
That's something we have to be very careful about and avoid because some people try to use other causes and advance their cause in the name of solidarity. So they say they're in favor of Palestine, but in fact, they have a deeper agenda of something they're trying to push and they use something like the, Pal the Palestinian issue, they'll use Black Lives Matter as a type of vehicle and use that, right? So we have to be careful and not be uh, silly people or dimwits. The other point that we have to be careful about is <clears throat> the Quran prohibits unconditional quid pro quo, right? In other words, you scratch, just because I scratch your back, you scratch mine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, in the ayah in Surah Ma'idah, there are two commands that are given for Muslims, but it is a principle that we can extrapolate the use dealing with anyone who aren't Muslims, including those people who aren't Muslims. And he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, said, wa ta'awnu al-birri wa taqwa, wa la ta'awnu ala idni wa udwan. You cooperate with one another and help one another based upon al-bir, that which is pious. And what is bir has to be based in what is truthful. Because the Prophet وسلم, said in a sitka yahi ila bir, in a bir yahi ila jannah, that truthfulness leads to piety and piety leads to paradise. So it has to be based in the truth. We cooperate with people based upon what is truthful. And then our justice is based upon something that's truthful, right? And with taqwa, in respecting Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, but don't cooperate with people. Don't cooperate with each other based upon the opposite of that, that which is not truthful, that which is haram, al ism means that anything that's haram, don't cooperate in advancing haram, and also that which disrespects the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So someone can come and say, oh, you know what? Um, I'm I'm in favor of freeing Palestine, but in the in but they say, oh, in our intersectional agenda, we also want to liberate um, uh, Palestinians or liberate Muslims for so-called sex work, meaning prostitution. Because that's a movement in America, right? Because mm -hmm. um, they, they they say you know um, making prostitution illegal is is sexism. So. They will say, you know, Israeli apartheid is racism and, you know, uh, illegality of prostitution is sexism. So they say, you know, that in order to be intersectional, we have to liberate the, 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 Palest the Palestinians from not only occupation, but that Palestinian women can be prostitutes, right? Mm -hmm. Or so-called trans Palestinians, right? In this type of framework, we would say, no, we can't cooperate with you based upon this. Why? Because they're trying to uh, advance something that uh, earns the anger, the ghadab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. So essentially, Sheikh Dawood, what you're saying is we must engage or, you know, to use terms from your, uh, from your book, um, we have coalitions and we have alliances. Um, yes. Alliances is when it's you, you join in with another group and they help your cause and you help them. And it's a reciprocal relationship. Um, but you argue, if I recall, that coalitions is what we really need to be building, where we can work with other groups towards one specific cause, focusing on the specific angle. So for example, in the question of Palestine, if MSAs were interested in working with other organizations on the Palestine topic, for example, to create BDS legislation at their university, the goal should be, uh, the objective should be clear to everybody that what we are working on is for this legislation for BDS and nothing more than that. And this is not a reciprocal relationship. We are uh, forming a coalition for this specific topic. And uh, what emerges after this, um, we can, you know, discuss, you know, if there's a different angle, we want to target the situation. Is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah, yeah. And the alliance, uh, or those who are allies, the allyship from the Quranic perspective is based upon transcendent values. So you're starting from one place, and you are respecting the same authority. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, El mu'minu wa mu'minat, ba'duhum aliya'u ba'd. Believing men and believing women are allies of one another. 
right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, do not take disbelievers as awliya over believers, right? As your allies. So this allyship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, he then describes who those believing men and believing women are. And it says, right? These are people who believe in enjoying the good and forbidding the evil. And they're starting from a similar epistemology of what defines good and evil, mm-hmm. right? Then they establish the prayer. And that means they believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they believe in making at minimum the five daily prayers. And this is an issue of, uh, of aqidah, of belief, and also fit of how to do the prayers. And they pay the charity, right? Then they obey Allah and his messenger in, 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 the, in other matters. This is allyship. Those people who fall outside of that, they can be coalition partners, hmm. right? They, they, they may not believe in Islam. Or even they may say they're Muslims and they're cultural Muslims. And they may a- a- advance things that are clearly haram based upon ijma. Right, not just things where there ikhtilafat or disagreements amongst the fuqaha. Like I mentioned, this issue of so-called sex work or prostitution. You won't find any jurists in the madhahib who are Sunni, who are Shi'i, or Ibadi, where it was says is jaiz to be a male or female prostitute. Right. So we, 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 we can't just, so let's say a Muslim, and I know some Muslims who say, oh, we need to legalize so-called sex work. Okay, well, uh, we uh, have spiritual affinity to all Muslims, but it doesn't mean that we are unconditional in that even with other Muslims, right? But definitely with people who aren't Muslims who say they don't believe in the Quran and don't believe in the finality of Nabuwa and Al Habib Al Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi wa alayhi wa wa sallam. Right. So thank you very much for bringing that uh, that point out from the book. Uh, but we need to know the difference, and we need to understand the difference in our language because this term allyship is overly used by many Muslim activists. Oh, we're in allyship, or these are our allies, or you know, we're in solidarity with such and such. Well, solidarity is actually really like a term in the activism space that comes from Marxism and neo-Marxism. So I don't even use that term solidarity, but these are people who are coalition partners on some issues. Now other issues, we'll disagree with them, but uh, we we invite people to what's good. And if they disagree, then we should respectfully say we disagree. Like, kum dino kum wali adin, do you your way and to me mine, right? And this is the way of our, of our prophet, alayhi salatu salam. And Sheikh, you bring up this excellent point of developing alliances and allyships, not necessarily just with uh, Muslims, but Muslims that share the same epistemology as us, the same criteria, which is the Furqan, the Quran and the Sunnah. Um, and I think too often we get deluded that just because a person is a, you know, is a Muslim, uh, therefore they have the same values as us. And I think what we're starting to realize in today's age is just because you're Muslim does not necessarily mean that you have the same values as us. Definitely. And I'll say that in political spaces in particular, if we talk about the U.S., I know Canada and the U.K. for sure too, because I'm closer to the Canadian and the British Muslims probably than other uh, Muslims uh, in the West. But we have many Muslims who are politicians, right? And some notable activists, Uh, They've led marches, they've written books, who they hold in our positions that clearly go outside the sacred law, that clearly have taken positions that aren't just even problematic regarding the fiqh, they're problematic according to aqidah, right? And it's because they're Muslim, we have to get out of this this mind frame and say, oh, well, oh, it's the first Muslim elected to this public office, so we have to get a Muslim in there. No, no, it's... It depends on what type of Muslim, right? Uh, Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf was a Muslim and look what he did to Saeed ibn Jubair and and other Muslims. I mean, he murdered and executed other Muslims unjustly. He was a tyrant, but he was a Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. And and, in these days, um, and and Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf wasn't even openly uh, trying to make uh, certain issues regarding 
sexuality, uh, he wasn't trying to make those halal, right? But now we have Muslims trying to make certain issues relating to sexuality and even the use of drugs who are openly trying to make, uh, uh, they're openly celebrating uh, uh, the, the, the haram. And uh, those people uh, don't deserve our unconditional support just because they have Muslim sounding names or they wear a hijab or have a beard. Hmm. Exactly. And I think, um, I think, it, I think it was Sun Tzu and his art of war who said the good uh, war is all deception. And um, the, the I'm paraphrasing, but the, the deception that hurts the most that you don't see is the one from within the own group. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's what happens. But um, the last topic I want to touch upon Sheikh Dawood um, is a very big topic is um, the topic of black lives matter. Um, in today's discourse, Black Lives Matter is probably the, the most prominent or the second most prominent uh, movement out there. Um, and there's been often a blind support um, for the organization. And I remember you've previously discussed the, the difference between Black Lives Matter as an organization and Black Lives Matter as, as, a, move, uh, as a movement. But what is your advice to Muslims on trying to navigate this topic of Black Lives Matter in today's discourse, both from an organization perspective and also from a movement perspective. Okay, let me let me say this very clearly: uh, racism and anti-Black racism cannot be legislated nor adjudicated away because racism, at its roots, and anti-Black racism at its roots, is 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 based in spiritual diseases. No set of laws or no set of marching can make someone respect my humanity. No set of laws can make a group of people in the dominant culture obey those laws. There's already laws in the books about police not killing black people, right? Um, it's, but police do it and juries have overwhelmingly acquitted people or prosecutors haven't brought forth cases. Right, so uh, the laws are on the books. Um, so that's one thing I have to say. We as Muslims, we believe that yes, laws are important. There has to be accountability, but we also believe that laws in and of themselves don't transform hearts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so love cannot be legislated. Respect, ikhtiram cannot be legislated. Um, regarding Black Lives Matter, um, Black Lives Matter, is a uh, is a mixed bag, right? Uh, there's been many different movements over the years that have tried to address the issue of police brutality of Black people, and 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 more recently the issues of mass incarceration uh, in the United States of America in particular. Black Lives Matter didn't start it; it's just a new flavor of the month, so to speak. Um, again, we have to be very clear about what the objectives are right, of, of an organization. Black Lives Matter as a mantra is true in the sense that white lives have always mattered more in the West than black lives, right? So it's just a statement of affirmation. Yes, black lives matter because black lives have never mattered as much as white lives in America or in Canada or in Britain and, or in France, and that's beyond a doubt, mm -hmm. right? That's, 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 that's last check. There's no doubt about that, right? The question then becomes though, <clears throat> within the agenda of the Black Lives Matter organization that was started not from black money, predominantly funded by foundations ran by white folks and being white doesn't make one bad, but not funded from the black community from foundations and now corporate America, um, we have to question the agenda of Black Lives Matter and that they say that uh, transphobia is akin to anti-Blackness in America. They say in order for Black people to be free, that trans people and gender neutral people have to be free, whatever that means. That's problematic for us as Muslims, right? Uh, I mean, it's problematic, it's a problematic um, PS, it, 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 it's PS fast, first of all, it's a, it's a fallacious analogy, but number two, like 
black people not being killed by the police has little to nothing to do with someone who claims that they're trans that wants to play a sport with, with women when they were born a biological male. Mm-hmm. Or, or I mean, it's, it's, it's so, it, in order to solve one problem, they say you have to embrace the other and celebrate it so that both can supposedly have equal rights. That's a problematic framework. And then we have to ask ourselves from a Shari perspective, we don't believe that in society, people can just act whatever way they want to act. Like freedom of expression, freedom of speech has limits according to us, right? So um, is LGBTQ a God-given right? People have people can do whatever they want behind closed doors, but do I have to accept it and use other people's pronouns? And if I'm teaching in a public school, am I mandated to teach this in, in history class, even when it goes against my bona fide held religious beliefs? I would say these two things are totally separate issues, and Black Lives Matter has confused the, 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 the issue. And unfortunately, after George Floyd was killed, a num- many Muslims uh, jumped on the BLM uh, bandwagon um, when uh, even without understanding that many black people in America who were marching in the streets have always been marching in the streets before Black Lives Matter, they were marching about the actual extrajudicial homicide that took place it wasn't necessarily supporting the Black Lives Matter program and agenda. So we we can't be confused about certain activists who are outspoken with actually the grassroots. These are totally different things. If you go to the grassroots of the Black community in America, I can tell you, I live in Detroit, which is 80% Black. It's America's Blackest major city. You know, a lot of what Black Lives Matter talks about and their agenda, once people learn about it, they're not supportive of it. Now they, they might say Black Lives Matter or wear a t-shirt because of the mantra, because of what it symbolizes, but they don't support the whole program. And I would say as Muslims, it's untenable um, for a Muslim uh, to be able to stick to their deen faithfully and give their total support to to the Black Lives Matter organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sheikh Dawood, um, you have experience working with Black Lives Matter. Um, do you mind, I remember you used to tell me that you and Imam Zaid used to, uh, used to, you know, there was a time where you guys were working with the organization. Um, I was wondering if you had, um, some experiences, um, of why, cause you, 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 you informed us that you no longer work with the organization anymore. Um, is there a specific reason as to why? Well, yeah. When Black Lives Matter first started, as after Mike Brown was killed in Ferguson, that was um, in the very nascent stages of the organization. Uh, Years later, there was a convening in Cleveland, Ohio, which was a black only gathering. Actually, a friend of mine who's Muslim tried to bring his uh, Puerto Rican American wife to it and they wouldn't even let her in because she wasn't uh, melanated enough, right? we quickly realized and saw, um, I'm speaking for myself, not Imam Zaid, Mm -hmm. uh, but I and others saw the agenda of Black Lives Matter and certain things that they were promoting that didn't jive with our faith, number one. Number two, it it almost seemed like on the stage at the time that there was a level of anti-straight male misandry. In other words, in order to have the main stage, you couldn't be a a straight black male. So it's like black males who aren't gay are overwhelmingly the victims of police brutality and extrajudicial killings by the police. Yet in the leadership of these organizations of Black Lives Matter and on the street level, you don't see reflected the people who are the primary victims of police brutality and being killed by the police, which are black men who aren't gay. So uh, that's why I know that this was a, 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 a radical, uh, a radical agenda 
uh, funded by people who are outside the grassroots of the black community, right? And as I did more research about their funding, then it, it was very clear um, that um, Black Lives Matter is, is predominantly serving the interests of agenda not established by the grassroots of the black community. So I, I, I can't, um, once I learned that, I, I stopped uh, using their hashtag. I don't even use their hashtag. Well, I haven't been on social media since Shop Band, uh, but um, even when I was on it, like for, for the last few years, like I would, if someone tagged me in something and had BLM hashtag or Black Lives Matter, I wouldn't retweet it, even though if I agreed with the content, simply because I didn't want to make it seem like I was supporting Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense, Sheikh. So now that Sheikh, that would, we talked about um, what social justice is, we've talked about the parameters of which we should be operating in. Uh, we've talked about um, the importance of, coal uh, of building coalitions rather than alliances. Um, the last question is, is what are uh, feasible, tangible ways of actually engaging in social justice in today's discourse? Um, because unfortunately in today's age, uh, social justice is just merely a set of hashtags, um, a set of retweets of changing profile pictures to black profile pictures or putting hashtags within profile pictures. Um, but what are some ways we can make institutional change within, within our own communities? Well, I guess the best advice I can give in this short period of time is that many times people want to change the world, but don't want to change themselves, mm -hmm. right? So if you're not getting up and making tahajjud, I mean, your five daily prayers you're supposed to be doing, if you're not getting up out of the bed and making tahajjud, right? If you're not doing daily salawat or in daily dhikr, if you're not seeking sacred knowledge to improve your spiritual state, you have no business being in activism, right? So we have to reflect the change that we want to see in the world, starting with our own spiritual states, right? We have to be equipped, right? And people who are spiritually sick can't heal the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to work on ourselves, right? And, and so the change really starts within, right? And that's before trying to join some organization or, 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 or a particular march. That's probably the most important thing I could say. Hmm. Do your prayers, wake up for tahajjud, stick to doing a, a, a daily dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and aslat al nabi Find yourself a spiritual mentor, which I also mentioned in the book. Find a murabbi or a murabbiya, a spiritual guide that you, can help you with your ego and you can get religious advice from right and take some classes to learn uh your dean not just uh the elm but also the adab of a proper teacher if that is done and you are preparing yourself then you can go and begin to tackle issues but don't try to tackle some of these great issues and you haven't uh prepared yourself it's like would a soldier go out to the battlefield in the olden days without armor and a sword? Of course not. So why are we trying to go out into the dunya and these activism spaces, which are toxic and out in this world, but without our armor and our sword? So, and, and, and our armor is working on our spiritual states and our sword is our ilm, it's our knowledge, right? So uh, sit still, get yourself a spiritual mentor, bench press those bed sheets off your bed, and get up and do some tahajjud. That's my advice. And I think it's excellent advice, Sheikh Dawood. And it's advice that comes from the Quran because in Surah Rad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In Allah la yugayyaru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayyaru ma bi anfusihim. That Allah will not change the conditions of a people until they first change themselves. And, you know, I think, I think from the, from, right from the beginning of the podcast, you've done an excellent job at talking about the importance of the spiritual diseases. Um, because in today's age with social media, we have many diseases such as pride, such as envy, such as greed, um, the love of the dunya. All of these things together will corrupt a person's intention. And once the person's intention, intention is gone, 
then the entire framework in which they're operating in has become corrupted. That's correct. And that ayah that you mentioned, surely a lot does not change the condition of, of a people. They change society themselves. We understand that, that as Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has given people and has given us a favor or, or a ni'mah. And when we deviate from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what pleases him, then Allah changes that favor or he takes that favor away from those people and that's when those people then become humiliated and their divine protection is gone so in order to get back into the good graces of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get back the ni'mah to get back his divine grace his fuddle we then have to make tawbah and return back to the commandment of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then he will restore our izza back to us or he restore our dignity back to us. So when we look at this, not just on local issues, but even we're talking about the global issue, right? The global issues, um, um, be it illegal occupation of Palestine or Kashmir, um, our activism alone through material means is not going to change the outcome without the fuddle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? If we, however, are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being faithful to his commandments, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's easy for him to say, kun fayakun, be in it is. Just like how um, we've seen other things happen in human history that people didn't think were possible, like the Battle of Badr, Allah just made it be, right? And, 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 and the Allah, Subhanahu wa ta'ala that supported Daud alayhi salam when he defeated Jalut. The same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who lifted up Isa alayhi salam when the Romans thought that they were crucifying him. The same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that saved the Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with them. At Badr is the same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can help us, hmm. right? But those people, Daud alayhi salam was obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isa alayhi salam was obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Sahaba were obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them divine help and divine support, right? But if we, if we think that we're just going to change things off our own activism alone and neglecting the Sharia, then we're just spinning our wheels. We're wasting our time. And, I think and no politics can help that. And I think an excellent angle, Sheikh Dawood, which we didn't get, uh, which we didn't discuss, is the topic of um, social justice uh, and despair. Because when you're operating within uh, the social justice activism, um, there's a lot of despair because you're putting in the effort, but things are not being changed. And I think uh, a beautiful verse from the Quran, which um, helps individuals in terms of this despair is uh, in Surah Al-Imran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahumma malika al-mulk, tu'ti al-mulka man tasha, wa tanzi'u al-mulka min man tasha, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, uh, it says, um, قُلِ اللَّهُمَّ مَالِكَ الْمُلْكَ that say, O oh, possessor of all authority, you give power, you give authority to whom you please, and you take it away from whom you please. And um, I remember when uh, Donald Trump first got elected, uh, and I remember I came across this ayat, you know, it, it was a change in worldview because I was like, who put Trump into power? Um, who allowed Trump or these other dictators to come into power? Because they have no moral authority without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is placing these people into these positions, you realize that ultimately there is a purpose as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them dominion has given them authority. And uh, to me, I think that was a very, very important verse of the Quran in terms of activism. Very true. And we can say this, that, and this is something that will help out the, the activists in falling to despair. That what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us is to have sincere intentions and to put forth our best efforts in following his commands, right? That's what he expects from us. But the outcomes, the final outcome is not in our hands, right? 
once we realize and internalize that the final outcomes are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Allah ala kulishin qadir, right? Once we understand that and believe that, that will cause us a lot of despair to lose a, the, and a lot of, and a lot, uh, uh, excuse me, it causes us to lose a lot of despair and cause us not to fall into a lot of grief, right? Because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge. And if an outcome came about that was different than what we wanted, then know that there's some wisdom in that. Mm -hmm. And it may be a means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is humbling us so that we can return back to his amr, to his command, right? So that is what we should understand. But once Muslims or people in general think that if we think as human beings that we're the ones that are ultimately running things or we're the ultimate determinants of outcomes, that is what causes us grief because number one, it's bottle, it's false. And then two, when things don't turn out the way that we want them to, uh, then it could cause us to, to give up hope and to be demoralized. But in reality, uh, the Qadr was never in our hand to begin with. Mm. And I think one of the most beautiful stories in the Quran, which illustrates this point of doing effort and realizing that results uh, alone, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala determines is a story of Nuh alayhi salam, who gave da'wah for 950 years. Um, and in those years, um, not that many people became Muslim. Um, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards him for the effort that he put in, not necessarily the results. And so the story of Nuh alayhi salam is a story of effort. And in Surah Najm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَلَّيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى وَأَنَّ سَعْيَهُ سَوْفَ يُرَى um, That the, the human being will see their effort. And so effort is uh, within these activism domains is what we should be pursuing and recognizing that the end result is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's correct. And let me say this, uh, and I know we're about to wrap up, but this relates to activism and the cancel culture. And I'm glad you mentioned that about Nabi Nuh in the 950 years of his da'wah, that we will call someone or invite someone to something, including other Muslims. And if they don't do what we want them to do one time, we're ready to cancel them. Mm -hmm. Nuh alayhi salam did, did da'wah and called his people for 950 years. Look how long, how many years Nabi Lut alayhi salam called his people to stop doing what they were doing until finally Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, okay, well, it's time to go because only the only people that were faithful to his message were his two daughters. Even his own wife disobeyed and, and collaborated with, 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 with the Qamu Lut, right? So my point is that uh, we shouldn't be so quick to, to cancel people. And we should also learn the lesson of Nabi Ayyub alayhi salam, right? Mm. We, we plant the seed. We don't know when the seed's going to germinate. Nabi uh, Ayyub alayhi salam called the people of Iraq towards Tawheed. They didn't accept when he was ready, when he thought they should. And in a mistake of haste, he went out into the, uh, the water as the story went, and then he went underneath the three levels of darkness, the darkness of the water in the darkness of the night and the darkness of the, of the big whale of the fish. And then when he realized that he was the reason why he was in that fish, he said, La ilaha la ant subhanaka inni kuntum min. There is no God, but you all Allah, glory is to you. And surely I am the ones who have wronged their own selves. Then when he was released after that powerful dua, when he got back to the shore, the people had accepted the message, mm -hmm. right? So it's like, you know, we just put forth the effort, but when the seed germinates, that's in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But uh, Nabi Ayyub alayhi salam, Allahu azza wa jal, let him see the fruits of his effort, of his efforts. He just didn't see them when he expected to see them. And that's a lesson for us, my brothers and sisters in Islam. Jazakumullah khairan, Sheikh Dawood. I think that was an excellent point to end off on. Um, recognizing the importance um, of putting in the effort, recognizing that we follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is what it means to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. Um, and, you know, may Allah protect us um, from one day being in a position where we're commanding people to evil and prohibiting the good. Uh, Thank you. Um, so Jazakumullah khairan, Sheikh Dawood. 
Uh, I hope everybody took benefit for this. Um, and uh, inshallah, hopefully, we will see you for next week's episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.